नमस्कार लर्नर्स वेलकम टू दिस सेशन आज के सेशन में हम नॉइस पोल्यूशन एंड इट्स कंट्रोल के बारे में बात करेंगे दिस सेशन इज ऑफ द कोर्स एम ई वी जीरो वन फाइव दैट इज एनवायरमेंटल पोल्यूशन कंट्रोल एंड मैनेजमेंट दिस इज अ पार्ट ऑफ द एम एस सी एनवायरमेंटल साइंस प्रोग्राम सो इन दिस सेशन वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट काइंड ऑफ पोल्यूशन which is noise pollution we all know about noise pollution but let us see what are the causes how does it affect us how does it affect other organisms and how can we control noise pollution from the causing various adverse effects first of all learners just tell me what is noise how do we differentiate between sound and noise when you hear something if you are watching this program you are listening to certain sound so that is the sound but you know it very well that sound is what it is actually the waves it is a kind of an energy it is because the transmission of the waves that the sound is produced which we are able to hear but when this sound crosses a limit or reaches beyond a certain decibel unit when it becomes unbearable or when it is unpleasant to hear that sound we call it noise so if i ask you what is noise that means the sound which is very loud may be coming from various sources it is it is not soothing to our ears it may be unpleasant or it may be unexpected at various times when explosions are occurring when very loud sound comes when an object falls down or something of a high intensity explodes so that is an unexpected sound so that becomes noise we very well and we very well uh, um, know the difference between the sound which is music or which is something beyond a certain decibel range which we are eager to listen to but beyond that it becomes noise so in other words we can say that any unwanted noise which is there in the environment and it has an adverse effect on the health of the organism it is called noise pollution we discuss various other types of pollution air pollution water pollution plastic pollution but this kind of pollution is generally not discussed much because it is believed that it is non lethal it doesn't have any risk as so as such to the life of any human beings or any other organisms so therefore we consider that noise pollution is not so much of concern like other types of pollution but however we must understand that with the um, you know with lot of technology coming up with so much of hustle and bustle going on with so much of construction activities going on this pollution is also uh, becoming a concern it is also leading to various adverse health effects which may not be visible so much but yes in fact they are affecting so much of the functioning of the human body along with that it has an impact on the environment so we must understand that noise pollution also has its own adverse effects which may generally not be known but yes they are and if you look at the category of the various types of pollutants uh we we see various physical chemical biological pollutants you must have learned about these different categories of pollutants in the various other sections of this course so noise pollution is is it's not a physical it's not a chemical it's not a biological pollutant but it is you know it is because of the waves that it is being caused okay so it is another kind of pollution which may not be visible you cannot quantify but yes it has an impact and there are different instruments by which we measure this noise by which we measure the sound at any particular place and we can also ascertain by that uh, uh, by that value that how much adverse effect it is causing on what kind of an object so learners um, uh, let us understand when it comes to noise pollution 
basically there are three elements which play a important role and which also determine that how much will be the impact of the noise on a certain uh, environmental setting on a certain group of the people first is the source of the noise now these sources may be suppose if two people are uh, talking in a very loud pitch so that becomes a source if there is a machine which produces the sound so that becomes a source so we can say that all those mechanical devices that radiate noise or vibratory energy such as appliances or machines we come across these machines very often we know how much of the noise is produced in industries we can see how much of the noise is being produced when we come across any construction activity going on in our domestic appliances also we very well notice the generation of the noise by the various apparatus by the various uh, appliances which we use so that is the source of the noise which is emanating the waves into the atmosphere so when we when we look at the different elements that source becomes very important and in today's times what we can notice is that the sources have become heterogeneous there are a lot of sources of the noise which which are coming up second important element of um, the noise is transmission path how does it transmit if it is being generated from an appliance or a mechanical device how does it reach to the maybe the receiver or to us so that transmission path is mostly the atmosphere which which you know which which leads to the transmission of that noise to different um, uh, components of the environment or if if not the case in the urban areas we can see the high rise buildings they also become the transmission source because they are there and if it is a forest area so it, you know that becomes the transmission path so the transmission path is actually basically the atmosphere from where the sound is being propagated so if we have to check the noise pollution if we have to see that it, it has a minimum adverse effect we also have to see the transmission path how does it get transmitted from the source to the receiver and the third element of the noise is the receiver that is the we an individual or a group of people who are living at that place who are working in those areas who are exposed to the noise either directly or indirectly so these three elements of the noise to a large extent determine the extent of noise pollution at any given place now you can yourself imagine and take the example of for example an industrial area or any small industry where you can see the source as the various machines which are used for processing which are used for cutting which are used for welding then there is a transmission path in the form of the atmosphere and then we have the receivers as the workers who are working without any protective garments without any protective devices so while working they are exposed to different kinds of noise high intensity low intensity and so on and so forth or you may take the example of any crowded market where you can see the multiple noise sources are there and from where the noise is being Uh, uh, you can say transmitted from the various sources to the various receivers so these three are the important elements of the noise now before we go into the details of how noise impacts us and how we can control noise pollution let us learn about the few terms which are very commonly used and we which we must understand for example the basic things are frequency of the sound you you must have heard that hertz is the unit of the frequency of the sound and um, uh, from between 20 hertz to 20000 hertz we can we can um, listen to the sounds you know the, all the sound there are so many types of sounds being produced while the human body functions the heart beats the lungs breathe so there are different noise sound produced at that time also but when it is below 20 hertz we cannot 
we cannot hear it and if it is about 20000 hertz again it becomes quite it becomes ultrasound so below 20 hertz it is in infrasound and above 20000 hertz it is ultrasound what does it mean as I said, sound is a wave. It is a it is a form of the energy. So the number of compressions, that is the high pressure of the sound, and the rare fractions, that is the low pressure sound, number of those compressions and rare fractions of the air molecules which occur in a given second or in a given unit of time, that is known as the frequency. Because when the sound travels in the forms of the waves there are high pressure and the low pressure sound levels. So the high pressure sound level is the compression and the low uh, sound pressure is the rare fraction. So how many times in a second those waves are, uh, mm, uh, are being generated that determines the frequency of the sound. So that frequency of the sound is measured in hertz. Another important term is loudness of the sound. We, we know, do not uh, uh, use the terms very often that it is a high, uh, it is very loud and it is very quiet. That means that what is the sound pressure level. There are, there are some um, uh, instruments which produce low level sound. However, there are certain explosions in the mining operations where we find that the high pressure sound is being generated. So that is the loudness of the sound which is measured in the decibel and we know that human ears, we can detect the sounds between 0 decibel and 140 decibel. So 0 is the threshold, below 0 decibel we cannot hear we were not able to perceive the sound as such and above 140 decibels it becomes painful. It, it is actually impossible for the ear to sustain or to bear this much of the sound which is above 140 decibels. So these are the few terms which, is very, which are very important for us to remember and we must understand them. Now the table which is there on the screen um, you can see that this is the decibel range and the different sources which, which we can see that the threshold of hearing it is 0 decibel below that we cannot hear and uh, we have the 20 decibel of the sound in the recording studio like this or the ambient level is there for example quite residential uh, neighborhoods they have 40 decibels. Uh, normal departmental store is 60, if you are shouting it becomes 80, in the printing press and other these things it is 100 and uh, uh, in the um, uh, ship's engine and rock concert it is 120 decibels and the moon launch it occurs at 140 decibels and the studies have indicated that above 80 decibels of sound if for 8 hours daily if we are exposed to for more than 10 years, it causes hearing deficiency in human beings. So, we must understand that these are the decibel ranges which are important for us to know and we must immediately get warned if the sound reaches above the prescribed sound limit of decibels. So, if it is above 80 decibels for the most of the part of the day, then it is a alarming situation and we must see that how we can reduce our exposure to the high sound pressure levels because it also causes an adverse effect on us. So what are the sources? How do we know? And yes, uh, and we have become so used to this noise pollution that many a times we are not even able to distinguish between the source and we, we Think of it as, as it is the normal situation. So the natural sources, yes, nature as, uh, also produces the noise or the sound. We have the birds um, and bugs, insects, animals, even at the time of natural calamities like volcanoes or thundering or lightning of the clouds, there is, and we know it very well that there is an um, a release of the sound, we hear to this sound, sometimes it is not so good to listen to that sound and it yes, if it persists for a long period of time, it thus becomes very, very painful. We know that when the dogs bark continuously, it is irritating 
one bird is chirping it is fine but when collectively birds uh, chirp together then it becomes unpleasant to listen to so these are some of the natural causes of noise pollution but more so we are worried about the anthropogenic sources of noise pollution like in other uh, cases also we have seen that anthropogenic sources are the most worrisome they are most problematic and they are of concern for example one of the uh, major sources that is the anthropogenic sources of noise pollution is transportation whether it is road transport railway transport or air transport you will be able to relate that yes all the sources of transportation redu uh, produce sound or cause noise pollution and if you take the example of the road transport you can see the honking of the vehicles sound produced by the engine of the vehicles and not only the vehicle per se but there are other factors also which are very very responsible for producing sound for example the type of the roads the speed of the vehicle and the machinery the parts which are being used in the vehicle so these are some of the transportation related causes for example if you take the example of air transport also the in the planes and helicopters also when they run they produce sound they cause noise pollution and th there also we can see that we can distinguish the noise produced by the aircraft into the airborne and the ground borne noise so there are uh, uh, noise produced while the ground level operations of the aircraft are taking place and in the air also the aircraft produces sound and in the air it will depend upon the elevation it will depend upon the atmospheric pressure it will depend upon the speed of the aircraft so these are some of the common sources of the noise pollution then we have the industries we know that industries are very noisy if it is a manufacturing industry we can see that while the products are being processed when the products are assembled when there is a fabrication of the products assembly of the products the processing of the various raw materials all these stages if you have looked closely you will find the generation of the noise is always there in hardly few circumstances we will find that it is a quiet process but most of the times not only the other pollutants but the industries are also blamed to be the major causes of the noise pollution also the fact remains this the, uh, the this is the fact that although they may not affect the population at large but it is very very serious issue for the workers who are working in those industries why we do not bother so much about the noise pollution by the industries because the products which come from the industries they are not accompanied by that sound so we do not think that we do not think that it is of much concern but think about the workers who are working for 8 to 10 hours minimum in these noisy environments so their health is being sacrificed then domestic sources we know that our homes with the different machinery the different appliances that we use in our homes the mixers grinders fans washing machines microwaves if you observe closely you will see that yes sound is produced which may be irritating many times then we have the commercial sources we can see in the markets uh, in the uh, in the crowded streets uh, in the local areas in the community places we find that they are the commercial sources of noise pollution where business is being done where uh, exchange of goods is taking place where people are shopping people are talking and all these activities are accompanied by the generation of noise pollution then social events it is said that we indians are a noisy people so every sentiment of ours whether we are sad whether we are angry whether we are happy all these sentiments are incomplete without producing noise pollution so these are uh, these are yes one of the sources of the noise pollution and it may be bothersome to the elderly if it is near the um, silent zones it may be troublesome so these are some of the anthropogenic sources of noise pollution 
and now let us see what is the impact how does it affect us so when it comes to noise yes there are auditory effects auditory effects means which are related to our hearing which which may interfere with our hearing ability we may not be able to hear so clearly or which may have a damaging effect on our ears and then there are non auditory effects which may not directly affect our hearing capability but they may affect our physical physiological and other metabolic functions of the body so what are auditory effects one of the auditory effect is acoustic trauma which means that suppose if we are exposed to to intermittent noise or instantaneous noise we may have a kind of a uh sensation in our ears which is uh, accompanied by pain or which is being um uh, leading to so many uh, types of uh, you can say inconvenience in our ears so this is the acoustic trauma which is uh, which may uh, be uh, get over when you are going to a quieter place again it may be a normal like situation but for the time being it may cause damage to the ear it may be, it is not a loss of hearing per se but it may be a kind of a uh, abnormality which may occur for a short period of time due to exposure of a person to high sound or whether it is intermittent or it is instantaneous then tinnitus tinnitus is when a person is exposed to sound for a very long period of time he may develop a kind of a buzzing and the ringing in the ears because the hair uh, because the hairs which are there in the inner ear which is the cochlea they may get damaged because of the uh, exposure to sounds of a high decibel range for a longer period of time so there is a continuous buzzing and the ringing in the ears which troubles the person then there may be temporary hearing loss for example it 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 is like as I, as i was telling before that if 85 decibel above sound level if a person is exposed to more than 8 hours a day for more than 10 years he may develop a kind of a temporary hearing loss which for the time being he may, may he or she may be not able to hear properly there is some interference of other kind of um, Uh, you can say sensations or the because of which is not able to hear. However, it may get back to normal if the person uh, gets treatment, or uh, the source of the noise if it is removed, that it may get to a normal position. However, there is a permanent hearing loss in case of an accident. Suppose an explosion takes place. Suppose a loud sound. It if it a person is exposed to. or in certain cases where a person is exposed to the noise for a long period of time then there may be a case of permanent hearing loss where a person is not able to hear completely because of exposure to noise for a longer period of time then there are non auditory effects and unfortunately we all are the sufferers and the victims of the non auditory effects of the noise pollution particularly those who live in the crowded spaces they may be sleeping disorders we are not able to sleep properly we are awakened most of the time or cardiovascular disturbances in the form of high bp in the form of irregular heart beats circadian rhythms and it has been seen in various cases that the people who are exposed to um uh, these kind of noise levels which are of very high frequency and loudness they developed heart diseases then noise pollution also triggers the release of neurotransmitters hormones because of which there are cases of aggression fights anger or oppositely it may be depression or migraines these type of behaviors are generally seen in the people who are exposed to noise pollution it affects the cognitive disability it leads to and because of which a person particularly problem solving language concentration 
In children particularly, this has been seen that if they are exposed to noise, it affects their learning, it affects their cognitive ability, it, it, it makes them lose concentration, they are not able to do problem solving effectively, language formation is not proper. So, it does affect our cognitive abilities also. It affects the social behavior. It affects, uh, uh, it's like most of the road rages if you look at, if you look at the cases of these uh, short temperedness, it is because of the continuously uh, being exposed to noise and noise pollution. So, a person uh, socially also, a person um, may suffer because of noise pollution, the social life is disrupted most of the times. Anger is there, frustration is there and aggression is there and these are some of the impacts which we are generally not able to relate. We hardly uh, are able to link uh, between the noise pollution and its effect on our health. So, these are some of the important things which we must understand. Then it does affect your mental health. It, it affects the people who are living in the noisy environments and it has been seen that they lack concentration, they are puzzled most of the times and uh, they are not able to take proper decisions. So, these kind of things are very common and therefore, utmost care must be taken to see that they are able to check the noise pollution coming from the various sources. Learners, apart from this, you will also find the studies have conducted and which have revealed that a noise pollution not only affects the human beings, but the marine elements are also affected by the noise pollution. So, uh, we must take care that noise pollution is also of great concern and uh, with this, I end the pre today's presentation. Thank you so much. that the world's population has reached 8 billion on 15th November 2022 and we are still counting. I don't know where do we go from here. The predictions are scary. Any idea how many people can Mother Earth sustain? India's growing population is a serious concern and we are soon going to become the world's most populous country. Wow, number one. Population is, after all, a human issue. The UN proposed sustainable development goals cannot be achieved unless and until we consider the population dynamics. So, here we are. Indira Gandhi National Open University offers appreciation course on population and sustainable development. The course explores the linkages between population and sustainable development. In this course, there are diverse issues related to population, environmental safety, livelihoods, human health, migration, urbanization and much more. The course duration is 3 months, but of course, you can complete it within a year. The eligibility of the course is graduation from a recognized university. So, if you are a development professional, working in a government sector, researcher, or keen to know more about the population and sustainable development, the course is must for you. Hurry up and join this course so that we are able to convert population into demographic dividend and not convert it into demographic disaster. For more information, visit www.igno.ac.in. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to this session. I am Professor Vivi Subramaniam, Professor, School of Computer Information Sciences, Indira Gandhi National Open University, Delhi. In our previous session, we had studied about the fundamentals of data warehouses. Queuing upon that particular session, in this session, we will concentrate on different approaches of DW design, that is data warehouse design, and data warehouse types of architectures. So this is the agenda of today's discussion. So these are the brief objectives. First, we cover the introduction to various data warehouse design approaches. Primarily, we'll be focusing on top-down approach, bottom-up approach, and then the steps to create through top-down approach and bottom-up approach. And then we will see the working of a data warehouse. And towards the end, we will see the four types of data warehouse architectures. Those are based on the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. So before going to the actual design, a data warehouse is a centralized historical repository in which one or more sources of information are collected. So these particular sources are many, maybe they are structured, they are semi-structured, and they may be unstructured also. From all these sources, we will the data warehouse will pull the data and then it will be ready for the usage. The basic objective of the data warehouse is used to collect and manage data from various sources in order to provide a meaningful insights. For most of the businesses, these particular insights are required. Suppose if you take the case of an e-commerce portal, so all these insights will make the e-commerce company to predict what all needs to put for the further sessions. So these particular insights are very much required and the data warehouse will help uh, to cater to these particular needs. So the data warehouse is the center of the data collection and reporting framework developed for the business intelligence. We call it as the BI in short. So this particular business intelligence platform are used to find the insights of any company or the insights of any business. So those particular business insights will be provided to the company in order to take future decisions. So these particular data warehouses are primarily used in the enterprise information resources. So the, there are two types of approaches, as you can see on the slide, the data warehouse design approaches are very important. Uh, whenever we are concentrating upon the design, these two primary approaches are being taken care. So we, in which particular platform or in which particular approach, you have to construct the whole data warehouse. Primarily, there are two uh, different approaches. One is the uh, top-down approach and the other is the bottom-up approach. So these particular data where suppose if you fail to predict and if you fail to design in a right way, it may, uh, it may call, lead to a kind of loss to the organization. So you have to decide the requirements and you have to plan accordingly and that too keeping in mind the two different approaches that we are going to talk. So there are two different data warehouse design approaches normally followed when designing a data warehouse and these particular approaches two different researchers has proposed. One is Bill Inman. We call him as the father of the data warehouse. So he was the person who has coined the data warehousing uh, term. So this particular uh, researcher, Bill Inman, has uh, given a kind of approach called as the top-down approach construction of DW. And then there is another researcher in the same area. So he is Ralph Kimball, and he has followed and he has proposed a different kind of approach in his research that is called as the bottom-up approach. So both the approaches are very much popular. Depending upon the needs of the business, you have to select one and you have to follow. That too we are going to discuss where lies the difference between these particular two approaches. So first of all, see the top, we will see the top-down approach. In this top-down approach, the data warehouse is designed uh, first and then data marts is built top on the data warehouse. 
So you can see here that the core data warehouse that is which, which is meant for storing the complete historical database that would be designed first and later on uh, the, the, it, the, the, from the data warehouse, data warehouse, centralized data warehouse, all the data marks will be pulled as per the subject area. So this particular subject orientation is one of the characteristic of the data warehousing. So as per the data, the, as per the subject that the uh, data mark consists of, so the, those particular data pertaining to the subject area, just like finance. So only the financial data uh, will be pulled into the data mark that is called as the financial data mark. So in this way, first of all, the data from the resources will be sent to the data warehouse or extracted, transformed and loaded into the data warehouse that is the centralized data warehouse. And later on, from that particular centralized data warehouse, data marks will be pulled. So this is called as the top-down approach. So at the top, the centralized DW is there and at the bottom, there are subject-oriented data marks. So let, me, let us see the step-by-step -step procedure how this particular data, uh, this particular top-down approach goes. So first step is that the data is extracted from the various source systems and then the extracted data is loaded and validated in the stage area. This particular stage area is nothing but it is a transformation where in which the data will be cleaned. So that particular staging area is called as the transformation in the ETL we call E for extract, T for transform, and then for L for loading into the data warehouse. So the, the middle step, that is the transformation step is nothing but the stage area. So validation is required to make sure the extracted data is accurate and correct. You can use the ETL tools to extract and push to the data warehouse. So this is the step one. And then after pulling this particular thing, the data, whatever that is extracted from the DW in regular basis in the stage area, at this step you will apply various aggregation, summarization, and other techniques on the extracted data that is being extracted from the source systems and loaded back to the centralized data warehouse. So this is the second uh, data. Here the main core component or core function that is happening is extracting the data, that too, using several techniques. You can observe here, one is the aggregation technique we had discussed upon, and the other is the summarization technique. Depending upon these two, the data will be once again loaded back to the data warehouse. In the step three, once the aggregation summarization is completed, various data marks will extract the data and apply some, of, some more transformation to make the data structures as defined by the data marks. So in the top, there will be the centralized DW, and in the, uh, in the and in the bottom there are various uh, various data marks that too depending upon the area or depending upon the subject orientation those will be selected and will be pulled. So this is the complete uh, three-step procedure in order to construct a top-down approach uh, design of the data warehouse. Let us concentrate upon the second model that is the bottom-up approach model. So this particular model, as I told you, is been uh, uh, is been uh, proposed by Ralph Kimball, and uh, this particular approach is called as dimensional modeling, or else you may call it as the Kimball methodology, or else the bottom-up approach. So these particular data marks are first created. So this is the reverse of the uh, proposal given by Inmont. So in this particular uh, proposal, what he has done is he has reversed the idea, and first the data marks will be created, and later on from the data marks the whole uh, the data will be pulled into the centralized data warehouse. So data marks are first created to provide the reporting and analytics capability for specific business purposes. Later on with these data marks, enterprise that is a centralized data warehouse will be constructed. So this is the approach given by the Ralph Kimball. And this approach is called as the uh, bottom-up approach and is reverse of Inmont's approach. In the step one of uh, bottom-up approach, the data flow in the bottom-up approach uh, starts from the extraction of data from various source systems into the stage area where it is processed and loaded into the data marks. So first the extraction and the transformation is taking place and then later on that particular data, transformer data is being pulled into the de uh, regular data marks. So that those are being uh, handled for specific uh, business purposes. And after that, the data marks are refreshed the current data is once again extracted in the stage area, transformations will be applied, and later on, 
all these things after the transformations is done that just like the summarization aggregation and other kinds of uh, techniques are applied after that uh, the uh, this particular data will be loaded into the enterprise data warehouse that is called as the centralized data warehouse and then made available to the users in order to do some sort of data mining or else in order to apply some sort of OLAP uh, uh, tools and techniques so that the, uh, the insights can be extracted. So this is how the complete, uh, uh, the complete uh, uh, bottom up approach is being split into two. That is the creation of the data marks, po pooling of the data marks, and then from that particular data marks, uh, the centralized data warehouse will be pulled into. So this is how the two step process of bottom up approach goes upon. So let us think a generalized uh, uh, data warehouse where and the working of uh, the whole complete uh, data warehouse. So in this particular uh, slide, you can see there are various components involved. One is the source system. So you can see here, operational data is there, external data is there, and then there is one component in between the centralized data warehouse and the uh, resources. So that is the load manager. So we will next uh, see the what is the functionality of the load manager, and then you can identify another component called as the warehouse manager over here, and then there is another component called as the query manager. So all these three components are very much uh, useful for this particular data warehouse uh, in, uh, in order to make them work. So you can see here it is the uh, this is the centralized data warehouse where in which the detailed information along with the summary information and the metadata is there in the uh, enterprise uh, data warehouse. And then uh, you can see that towards the right end, you can see the OLAP tools or else you can call as the data dippers. So this, this is the kind of uh, the block diagram that we can draw uh, whenever uh, the, 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 there comes the question like data warehouse working and other kinds of things. So let us see what exactly is the functioning of the uh, load manager. This particular load manager of a data warehouse, it is responsible for collection of data from the operational resources and converts them into usable form for the users. So uh, here, uh, uh, whenever you say that loading, so there lies the three kinds of components, that is ETL components. One is extraction, then transformation, and then the loading. So all these things will be done by the load manager, where in which the, from the resources or else from the source uh, systems, the data will be pulled and then it will be cleaned and then transformed using the uh, other techniques and then it will be loaded into the uh, enterprise data warehouse. So this load manager is the core component which collects the data from the operational systems and convert them into the usable form for the users. So this component is responsible for importing and exporting data from the operational systems, and it includes the programs and application interfaces. We are just verbally speaking that it should be clean, but there should be some sort of programs which will be taking care whenever there is some sort of data noise or else any kind of missing data is there. There are certain applications or there are certain algorithms which do, which perform those particular functions in order to clean the data and uh, uh, within the load manager and then that particular load, uh, the clean data will be transformed, loaded into the enterprise data warehouse. So it is responsible for pooling the data out for the operation, uh, uh, pooling out data from the operational systems, preparing it, loading it into the warehouse. So this is the functionality and whenever you see the key functions that the load manager uh, will do, those are listed on the slide. That is identification of data is one of the function validation of that particular data within the uh, 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 sources about the accuracy, then extraction of that particular data from the original source, cleaning the data, that is by eliminating the meaningless values or else the null values or else the, uh, the, the noise that is there along with the data. And then data formatting is also the function of the load manager. And then data standardization, merging of the data, and establishing the referential integrity. So all these uh, all these functionalities are happening within the load manager. In order to handle these kinds of functionalities, there are several, there will be several interfaces as well as there are several programs which take care. So this is not a single program. This is the comprising 
uh, the load manager will comprise of a set of programs where in which each and every functionality, whatever that is listed over here, will be undergoing and then it will be loaded into the data warehouse for the user's purpose. So there is another component as we had talked upon that is the warehouse manager. The warehouse manager is nothing but the centralized data warehouse itself is called as the warehouse manager. It is a large physical database that holds a vast amount of information from a wide variety of sources. So the data within the data warehouse is organized such that it becomes easy to find, use, and update frequently from its sources. So there will be a kind of refreshing feature also where in which always the data warehouse, whatever the data uh, that is coming upon the historical data that will be refreshed in various cycles that too uh, within, uh, within the prescribed timings that we had set for, for the program in order to refresh. So the warehouse manager it is nothing but the data warehouse itself. Then there is another component called as the query manager and this particular query manager provides the end users with access to the stored warehouse information through the use of specialized end user tools. So when, uh, ultimately, uh, we, it, uh, ultimately we address uh, th this particular data warehouse will address the RLs will help in order to find out the insights. Some from where the insights will be coming, it will be coming from the stored data. So data warehouse will be storing the data and using these particular mining tools or else you can call them as the data dippers or else OLAP tools, using those particular tools, we will be extracting the insights, uh, insights from the data warehouse. So data mining access tools uh, having various categories such as just like simple queries, it may be a kind of complex queries, some sort of reports maybe we, uh, we can generate some sort of reports, OL, uh, OLAP, that is online analytical processing uh, reports we can generate, statistics we can generate, data discovery we can do, we can do uh, and visualization techniques, depending upon the visualization techniques that we apply upon the data warehouse, various kinds of visualizations you can uh, uh, go through uh, and then uh, geographical information system, all these things are uh, the tasks of the query manager. So there are another component, or else you can call them as the set of tools. Those are the end user uh, access tools, and this is divided into the very, uh, several categories, like one is the simple reporting kind of thing, which is called as reporting the data. It may be a query tools, data dippers are there. Uh, data dippers means it is nothing but the business tools that allows uh, for generation of standard reports and queries. And there may be some sort of reports we have talked about, that is the online analytical processing tools and there, are, there may be some other tools called as the data mining tools. So these particular end user access tools are nothing but they, may, they, they will be helping the user in order, to, uh, in order to apply them on the data warehouse that is there and then in order to get the insights or else the kind of reports those can be generated uh, maybe ranging from some years together like five years or seven years or else he may be applying some sort of visualization techniques where in which a bar graph or else 3D graphs can be drawn from the uh, enterprise data warehouse. So this is what we had discussed, like uh, in the components we had discussed the load manager, which is responsible and which is the interface between the core um, the data warehouse and the source systems that are placed on the left hand side. And then we had talked about the uh, warehouse manager, it is a set of programs where in which it will be acting or else it will be maintaining the detailed information, summarized information and metadata information within the enterprise data warehouse. And we had talked about the query manager where in which this is the interface between the core data warehouse and then the uh, end user end tools that are those may be data dippers, OLAP tools or else reporting tools, data mining tools, whatever the case may be. So depending upon the uh, two approaches that we had discussed, uh, there are various kinds of architecture one can generate. In RA, we had, uh, we had just discussed that uh, a centralized data warehouse can be created and from that, uh, the data marts will be pulled in the top-down approach. In the bottom-up approach, we had told that first the data marts will be pulled into and then later on the enterprise data warehouse will be created. So depending upon these two approaches, these are gener generic approaches, but we can derive altogether five architectures from the uh, design approaches. So one is the generic two-level architecture, which is very simple. And then second one is the independent data mark architecture. Third one is the dependent data mart and operational data store. And then fourth one is the logical data mart and active warehouse. 
and fifth one is the three layer architecture so currently uh, there is another kind of architecture which is proposed and which is very much popular nowadays used by many um, multinational companies that is the cloud based architecture also so in the next uh, session most probably will be uh, learning about the cloud based architecture also but however we will first look into uh, these uh, architectures one by a, one by one so first one is the generic two level architecture proposed by hopper prescott and uh, fadden this is a simple architecture which we were discussed earlier these are the source systems source data systems and the data may be either it may be structured unstructured or else the the the, the data may be even semi structured also so from these particular uh, data uh, source systems the data is extracted and then placed onto the data staging area so this is the main area where in which the complete processing of the data will be happening that is the cleaning of the data reconciliation of data then matching data standardization all these kinds of things will be happening over here and there will be several programs which will be uh, present in the data staging area which will be helping in order to they make the data into a clean format which will be pulled into the uh, loaded into the data warehouse so you can see here among the etl you can see here extraction is taking place and uh, the data is extracted from the source systems and that to various kinds of data it may be and then it is been staged on this particular area and then the transformation is going on over here so once again e is completed t is completed and then there will be a kind of load interface or load manager which will be taking care the the, the whatever the data that is been already transformed and is placed on that data staging area will be pulled into the data warehouse so this is how the complete generic this is a simple two level architecture and then you have you have the extreme uh, right side and you have the end user presentation tools so there may be some sort of advice uh, like query handling or query related tools or report writers may be one of the component end user applications visualization tools or else mining tools whatever the case may be so those will be happening over on the right hand side so this is the simple uh, two level architecture and then there is another architecture uh, there is another architecture called as the independent data marks architecture where in which there is a slight change when compared to the two level architecture extraction uh, from the data source systems it will be happening then transformation is the same thing that uh, that has, that was we were, that we was discussed in the uh, with the earlier architecture and then loading is happening but you can see here the whole data whatever that is being transformed over here is not pulled into the centralized data warehouse however there is a cre there is a creation of data marks that to based upon the uh, subject oriented areas so those particular subject were depending upon the subject oriented area each and every data mark will be handling a particular data so that it will cater to the need of that particular subject area only suppose it may be administration it may be finance and it may be several other uh, uh, data marks which will be uh, catering to the needs of that particular subject area only so here the whole centralized edw is missing and then the data marks are appearing over here individually and then obviously the uh, on the right hand side there there may be the several end user presentation tools so there is a slight difference when compared to the uh, two level uh, architecture uh, here we are uh, totally uh, the data marks are taking care of the individual query handling and then there is a third uh, the third uh, uh, third architecture called as the dependent data mark with operational data store here you can see in the data uh, in the in the uh, lo after loading has taken place there is the there is a creation of a kind of enterprise data warehouse and then later on the same uh, data marks are been created so this is a kind of hybrid approach where in which the first model and the second model combinedly working over here where in which the enterprise data warehouse is also present and later on that from that particular uh, enterprise data warehouse the concerned data is being pulled into the data marts also so this is the variation that the third architecture has and then in the fourth architecture there will be a kind of uh, active data warehouse wherein which 
it is a combination kind of thing. After the extraction of the data, it is a combined thing where in which they had combined the transformation and loading. Both uh, trans e extraction is taking place and the transformation and loading are combined over here. And then there will be a kind of transformation in the form of a layered approach so that all the data will be transformed and then it will be thrown into the data marks, individual data marks. So this is the kind of logical data mart and active data warehouse. So this is the basic difference between the earlier models. And then there is, a, uh, uh, so this is nothing but this particular active data approach, whatever that we are calling, this is not a kind of physical data marks. Those are the logical views just like in the databases we create a view. Likewise, these data marks are not physically existing. However, these are a logical views created on the enterprise data warehouse, where in which the pool will be uh, visible in the uh, views. And then from there, the data presentation tools can be used and the things will be extracted. So with this, uh, 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 I hope we, you had understood about the approaches that we had discussed and then the step-by-step -step procedures that we had discussed, the working of the data warehouse that we had discussed, and then the four or five uh, data warehouse arch architectures basing upon the design approaches that we had discussed over here. So these are the references. Uh, you can go through unit one of block one of MCS 221, data warehouses and data mining in order to uh, get more understanding on these particular uh, topics. Thank you. Uh, hope you had understood this particular topic Wish you all the best. The world's population has reached 8 billion on 15th November 2022 and we are still counting. I don't know where do we go from here. The predictions are scary. Any idea how many people can Mother Earth sustain? India's growing population is a serious concern and we are soon going to become the world's most populous country. Wow, number one. Population is, after all, a human issue. The UN proposed sustainable development goals cannot be achieved unless and until we consider the population dynamics. So, here we are. Indira Gandhi National Open University offers appreciation course on population and sustainable development. The course explores the linkages between population and sustainable development. In this course, there are diverse issues related to population, environmental safety, livelihoods, human health, migration, urbanization and much more. The course duration is 3 months, but of course you can complete it within a year. The eligibility of the course is graduation from a recognized university. So, if you are a development professional, working in a government sector, researcher, or keen to know more about the population and sustainable development, the course is must for you. Hurry up and join this course so that we are able to convert population into demographic dividend and not convert it into demographic disaster. For more information, visit www.ignu.ac.in. Thank you. पहाड़ों पर जाना किसे पसंद नहीं? इस तरह के पहाड़ तो आपने देखे ही होंगे। चलिए, आज आपको विशेष प्रकार के पहाड़ों की सैर कराते हैं। ये हैं कूड़े के पहाड़, जिनके बोझ तले दुनिया दबी जा रही है। इन कूड़े के पहाड़ों में हैं हमारे घरों, कार्यालयों, उद्योगों से निकलने वाली बेकार की वस्तुएं, 
पुरानी लकड़ी धातु कांच के सामान सब्जी फलों के छिलके पुराने मोबाइल लैपटॉप इत्यादि कूड़े के ये पहाड़ न केवल शहरों में बल्कि गाँव में भी पाए जाते हैं अपशिष्ट की बढ़ती हुई मात्रा और इसकी विषैली प्रकृति हमारे पर्यावरण और स्वास्थ्य को नुकसान पहुंचाती है कभी सोचा है इसका निपटान कैसे होता है या क्या होता है इन कूड़े के पहाड़ों का कैसे हम इस समस्या से छुटकारा पा सकते हैं इन सभी प्रश्नों का उत्तर देने के लिए इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय मुक्त विश्वविद्यालय अपशिष्ट प्रबंधन में प्रमाण पत्र कार्यक्रम प्रस्तुत करता है यदि आप नगर निगम में कार्यरत हैं सैनिटरी इंस्पेक्टर हैं अपशिष्ट प्रबंधक हैं या अपशिष्ट से जुड़ी हुई परामर्श सेवाएं अनुसंधान या विकास कार्य करते हैं तो ये कार्यक्रम आपके लिए सर्वोत्तम कार्यक्रम की न्यूनतम योग्यता है बारहवीं उत्तीर्ण और इसे छह महीने में पूरा किया जा सकता है या अधिक से अधिक आप इसे दो साल के अंतराल पर भी पूरा कर सकते हैं कार्यक्रम में शामिल है स्व शिक्षण पाठ्यक्रम सामग्री ऑडियो वीडियो संसाधन और विभिन्न माध्यमों से शिक्षण की सुविधा तो फिर देर किस बात की चलिए समस्या का नहीं समाधान का हिस्सा बने अपशिष्ट प्रबंधन में प्रमाण पत्र कार्यक्रम में दाखिला लें हम आपके स्वागत के लिए आतुर हैं अधिक जानकारी के लिए Namaskar and a very very warm welcome to this very channel we call it Gyan Darshan. As you all know, this is a, a live program which we are organizing for the benefit of of our learners, and we take this opportunity to welcome all our regional directors, all our academy counselors, the learner support centers, and all the prospective learners. हम आप सबका इस तहे दिल से आपका इस कार्यक्रम में स्वागत करते हैं जैसा कि आपको पता है ज्ञान दर्शन एक ऐसा माध्यम है जो आपको और विश्वविद्यालय को आपके करीब लाती है इट इज़ ए ब्रिजिंग गैप बिटवीन यू एंड दी यूनिवर्सिटी एंड आपको जानकर के और खुशी होगी कि ये एक तरफ का प्रोग्राम नहीं है वी आर Uh, into a interactive live session program and to interact with us we are having our studios number which i am just uh, being reflected on the uh, your screen also but just for your information i just like to repeat it for you uh, uh, we are having our studio number 011 ye delhi ka code hai 011 2953 2844 2953 2844 dusra hamara number hai टू नाइन फाइव थ्री टू एट फोर फाइव वैसे दर्शक वैसे श्रोता जो हमसे जुड़ना चाहते हैं टोल फ्री नंबर से तो हमारा टोल फ्री नंबर भी है वन एट जीरो जीरो वन वन टू थ्री फोर सिक्स और इसी आशा के साथ कि आप आप हमसे आज जुड़े रहेंगे इस आधे घंटे के कार्यक्रम में मैं आज बड़ा ही भाग्यशाली हूँ कि आज हम अपने साथ अपने बड़े ही काबिल और विषय विशेषज्ञ को हम आपके सामने प्रस्तुत कर रहे हैं आज हमारे एक्सट्रीम राइट में बैठी हैं प्रोफेसर बी रूपीनी आप स्कूल ऑफ जो हमारा स्कूल है स्कूल ऑफ इंटरडिसिप्लिनरी और ट्रांस डिसिप्लिनरी स्टडीज उसकी आप एक सीनियर प्रोफेसर हैं मैडम आपका स्वागत है इस कार्यक्रम में आ, उनके जस्ट बगल में बैठे हैं डॉक्टर सुष्मिता भास्कर आप भी इसी स्कूल की एक फैकल्टी हैं आपका भी हम इस कार्यक्रम में स्वागत करते हैं हमारे साथ प्रोफेसर आर बास्कर हैं 
आर भास्कर साहब स्कूल ऑफ साइंसेस में हैं बट जिस कार्यक्रम की आज हम आपसे चर्चा करने जा रहे हैं उनके आप कोर्स कोऑर्डिनेटर प्रोग्राम कोऑर्डिनेटर भी हैं तो बिना समय बताए बिताए हुए हम आपसे ये बताना चाहते हैं कि आज जिस कार्यक्रम की हम चर्चा कर रहे हैं उस कार्यक्रम का नाम है पी डिप्लोमा इन इन्वायरमेंटल मैनेजमेंट एंड लॉ जब इन्वायरमेंट की मैनेजमेंट और लॉ की बात होती है तो विषय अपने आप में बहुत बड़ा दिखने लगता है जी हाँ वेन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट पी जी डिप्लोमा इन एनवायरमेंटल मैनेजमेंट एंड लॉ इट इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड वेरी वेरी फोर्थ कमिंग एरियाज वेयर वी हैव टू टॉक अबाउट सो शुरुआत यहीं से शुरू करते हैं कि भाई इस कार्यक्रम की Uh, कि जब परिकल्पना की जा रही थी वाई दिस काइंड ऑफ प्रोग्राम्स आर बींग इनविसाइज बाई द स्कूल आई वुड लाइक टू आस्क प्रोफेसर आर भास्कर फर्स्ट दैट वाई दिस प्रोग्राम फॉर होम दिस प्रोग्राम इज वेयर दिस प्रोग्राम इज गोइंग टू बी यूज फॉर आर कंट्री एंड ऑल अबाउट दिस प्रोफेसर भास्कर थैंक यू सर फॉर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग दिस स्पीकर टॉपिक ऑफ टू दिस डिस्कशन uh the uh, the program was conceived uh, all three of us the program coordinators myself professor rupini and uh, dr sushmita baskar because we thought that a uh, lot of environmental uh, issues are there and uh, if you see the issues it is related to population growth it is related to urbanization it is related to industrialization and it is related to the attention uh, the world community is giving to sustainable development goals and everything if you see even the w uh, world economic forum meet uh, the climate change and other issues disasters are occupying the center stage so we thought we should have a program which deals with this second we did a survey and we found that uh, not uh, we could not find uh, hardly one place or so in india which could offer a program on uh, environmental management and law we had environmental management or we had environmental law we did a survey and we felt that uh, this program we got a good response and the idea here is environmental management deals with the management of resources it deals with the habitat contamination it deals with the ecosystem management and it is basically managing the natural resources so the first thing the student should be aware is how what are the environmental resources and how to manage it so an environmental manager is one who manages the natural resources in such a way that it is uh, having optimum output and minimum uh, damage to the environment we we integrated law because uh, we thought that environmental management can be done if the law aspect is understood by the students or the prospective learners when we saw the job prospects uh, there are many institutions uh, which employ them but as of now they don't have trained manpower so this course of ours will be very useful like there are many ngos which deal with environmental issues but they are not aware of the legal aspects of it there are many government agencies like pollution control board which employ these kind of uh, qualifications if you qualify then there are uh, consultancies which can be done then uh, there is uh, uh, environmental impact assessment studies can be done if you are a lawyer then if you are a journalist again you can see nowadays green issues have become very important and separate channels are started coming even if you see uh, uh, the different channels national geographic or bayon as climate track tracker all these require understanding of environment and law so these kind of opportunities are there for this field so with this background we thought that we will uh, propose this uh, program and uh, we have designed the program and my colleagues will be sharing more yeah. details with you thank you professor and uh, as you all know this program is of immense use for us in a society like us where we are having a concern of environment and we do not know at least we are not aware about the law which are there to protect our mother environment and uh, uh, as you all know this is a very very newly launched program we have launched january 2023 so you must be aware of the fact that kaun sare log isme admission le sakte hain aur kya iski fees hai is cheez ki jankari hum 
प्रोफेसर रूपी से लेते हैं कि ये किन के लिए है और क्या कौन एडमिशन ले सकते हैं क्योंकि मैं भी बड़ा एक्साइटेड हो रहा हूँ इस कार्यक्रम में एडमिशन लेने के लिए मैडम रूपी थैंक यू वेरी मच सर एंड वेलकम टू दिस सेशन एंड यस एनी ग्रेजुएट कैन ऑप्ट फॉर दिस प्रोग्राम सो द एलिजिबिलिटी क्राइटेरिया इज एनी ग्रेजुएशन फ्रॉम एनी डिसिप्लिन एंड दिस दिस इज अ पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट डिप्लोमा इन एनवायरमेंटल मैनेजमेंट एंड लॉ एंड द मीडियम ऑफ इंस्ट्रक्शन इज इंग्लिश ऑफ कोर्स द ड्यूरेशन ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम इज मिनिमम वन ईयर and the maximum is 3 years that means once you have taken the admission into this program you have to com- complete this program within 1 year or it is extended to 3 years up to 3 years so the target group just now we have discussed that is a graduation from any discipline that means any graduate can opt for this program and uh, uh, one minute ma'am yeah, and yeah. Uh, as you said that minimum uh, duration of this program is 1 year mm-hmm. and maximum is 3 years what i understand is that a uh, university is holding them live on our admission register for all 3 years yes sir because if due to any reason if some student is not able to finish the program within 1 year that means they will be live with the same program fee of 7000 rupees and they can do the program at their own pace and they can complete in maximum 3 years of yes, duration sir. that is the beauty of this university over to you ma'am yeah. Okay. you were talking about the objective why this what are the objectives yeah, of yeah. this program yes sir we have uh, um, uh, done that survey also and then we have made some objectives for this program the first one is to identify various environmental issues laws and policies at the national and global level and the second objective of this program is to discuss the inter- interrelationship between the environmental management principles and law and the third objective is to understand the relationship between the environmental management law and policies and final objective for this program is to apply the environmental principles which we have already learned and also to apply these environmental principles and policies to build sustainable societies in tune with the sustainable development goals and uh, of course if if yeah, I, i have a question over here ma'am <coughs> so looking at this uh, eligibility criteria and the kind of objective it has encircled in itself it looks like that even those who are working somewhere yes. maybe in the environmental sector maybe in the ngo maybe uh, some other f- sector they can also take admission and they can also have a greater benefit of this particular program yes. uh, i would like to hear from you yes sir that is true any any graduate or any st- student or any person those who are working in any of the sectors also and then strong inclined with the environment to do something to the society right. to benefit the society they can opt for this program okay. sir so it's a double benefit that it's a any uh, fresh graduate can take admission to build their career in the environmental sector or those who are a person like me who is already into the job and those who are working with some organization and having the concern for environment they can also join this very program so thank you very much uh, all these uh, program coordinators for bringing such a beautiful program for us i would like to add to what you said yeah. sir made a very important point that uh, we can uh, through this program create citizen uh, uh, activist in the sense they will know their rights once they know their rights if their environment is damaged they can file a case in the appropriate uh, authority courts and get you know the rights uh, restored so they will be aware of what are the rights they have as citizens what is the environmental rights they have thank you professor uh, baskar and uh, now over to ma'am to know about more about the kind of the program how it has been structured what you are going to teach them so that is what i would like to hear from you ma'am sure sir and the program comprises the 11 courses out of 11 courses the learner has to select any uh, 10 courses right. so each course carries four credits each right. that means one has to complete the 40 credits of uh, the co- uh, 40 credits that means 10 courses they have to opt out of 11 courses so we will see that what type of courses we have incorporated in this one the first course is mev 011 that is a fundamentals of environmental science and ecology in that you will be uh, uh, studied that the uh, concepts of the environmental science fundamentals of ecology ecosystem dynamics and processes and the domains of environmental science have been given in detail and the second course is meve 019 that is a environmental issues in this we have clearly explained that 
lot of environmental issues and then atmospheric issues like land and soil issues, water related issues and also security and developmental issues have been dealt with. And the third course if you will see that that is MEVE 011 that is a global climate change. So in that the introduction to global climate change and global climate past and future and also impacts of the climate change and response strategies to the climate change have been discussed in this course. And the next course is MEV 012 that is a environmental management. It is most important. The name indicates itself the title of the program that is the introduction to management. And also we have discussed clearly that the key areas in environmental management and, and uh, environmental management and sustainability. And also we have discussed here it is tools for environmental management. If you will see the next course that is a MEV 003 that is a environmental law and management and here clearly we have explicitly explained the environmental acts, laws, policies, awareness, responsibility and also the complaints and environmental management techniques as well as the environmental standards. So these are the courses, yeah. some of the courses. So I think uh, so very rightly mentioned by you the kind of the course structure we are looking at it is covering the whole gamut of the environmental concern, its environmental management and the laws which are uh, really making us aware how to protect the uh, great uh, mother earth for all of us. I would like to uh, now uh, go back to uh, Madam uh, Dr. Susmita Bhaskar that uh, Madam has talked about that there are 11 courses and uh, uh, every course uh, is of four credit and out of these 11 courses, 10 has to be covered to complete this PG diploma. Uh, uh, she has talked about few courses. Now, may I uh, request you to explain about the rest of the courses, rest of the six courses or seven courses you have to. Yes, sir. So all the programs uh, here, they are relevant to the discipline of environmental uh, sciences. And especially we have taken those courses important for environmental management as well as environmental law. So, Madam discussed with the first uh, five courses. The next is MED 005, that is Integrated Environment Management, Urban and Rural. So, here we talk about environmental management both in the urban as well as in the rural uh, uh, places. And then we have the MEVE uh, 004, that is dealing with the industrial sector. So now in the industrial sector, we have, you know, a lot of uh, hazards uh, which are happening, which uh, they can be the hazards which are, you know, impacting the human health and so on. So and also to the environment, for example, the technological hazards, the Bhopal gas tragedy. So yes. this has been discussed with a lot of the case studies mm -hmm. and also the safety acts, the factory act. So all these acts also have been discussed in this uh, course that is uh, MEVE 004. The next course is MEVE 003, so agriculture and allied sector. Agriculture forms the backbone of uh, any country's economy. And here again, in agricultural sector also, we have several problems, the use of pesticides, the use of fertilizers. All this is impacting the environment. And then the kind of produce that we are getting, all that is also impacting the environment, the groundwater, soil pollution, and the human health is being affected. So here again, in some of the units, we are discussing about how we turn to the, uh, of course, the aquaculture pollution, livestock pollution is discussed, and how we can turn towards sustainable agricultural management practices. So here we talk about organic farming, vermicomposting methods, and other methods which are all um, paving the way to achieving the sustainable development goals. The next course is MEVE 001, that is Environmental Impact Assessment for Environmental health. The term itself indicates environmental impact. That means what are the impacts that are facing the different sectors of the environment. Right. So this could be like the impacts of the cement industry, of the mining industry, of hydroelectric power projects and so on. So for every impact assessment to be done, there are several processes like scoping, screening, planning, the risk assessment. So before we sanction or give any authority, you know, to uh, start any project uh, or go ahead or a green signal, these impact assessments and risk assessments are very important uh, to see how the air, water or the soil is going to be impacted by that project. Then we have the next course that is MEVE 015, that is disaster management. Here we have defined the differences that is between hazard and disaster. 
and the different types of natural hazards the environmental hazards technological hazards man made and uh, in human induced disasters for example the chernobyl disasters then um, various other you know uh, and also uh, the kind of the um, bhopal gas Bhopal's. tragedy and also environmental uh, hazards by the leakage of uh, certain harmful uh, chemicals and noxious chemicals into different uh, sectors of the ecosystem so these are discussed over here again in disaster management the risk assessment study is very important and the uh, national disaster management uh, framework and how the national disaster management authority and national institute for disaster management nidm and uh, ndma their role both the state and the central government and how the disaster management can be properly managed at every uh, point and the national level the last course is the nve 017 that is discussing about environment and society so when we talk about environment now it is very important that we take the larger uh, thing into uh, into a being that is the society is being impacted so all the relationships between environment the socio economic concerns again even when we are talking about any uh, project for example a dam is being constructed what are the socio economic impacts that are going to uh, happen in that area so then we are also discussing about um, the uh, d- different forms of the andolan or the movements that have occurred the eco social movements that have occurred in the past and also which is uh, you know going on in the present and continuing so the linkages between the environment and the uh, society these concerns have been discussed in this uh, course okay so uh, you are very uh, thankful to both of you for detailing out the kind of courses you have incorporated in this very important program now uh, my concern today is that we are talking to our prospective learners the environmentist those who are there on the other side the regional directors the academic counselors and many others those who are looking uh, who are really attending to this particular program how you are delivering this program now we are sitting in delhi we are having regional center across the country how this program is being delivered hamare gaon ka ek bachcha jo remote jharkhand mein baitha hai या रिमोट तमिलनाडु में बैठा है हाउ दे कैन मेक बेस्ट यूज ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम सो वी वुड लाइक टू हियर फ्रॉम यू प्रोफेसर रूपिनी Uh, yes sir we have the uh, self learning material we have developed it is in the print mode, mode also and also in the eslm so that is also there so the student can uh, opt for any of this program any of this mode so they can access this uh, uh, material from the e gyan kosh and audio video programs for the counseling sessions we are using and then we are using uh, uh, teleconferencing system also we are using and then we are delivering we are live sessions just like uh, today's live session. we are giving the uh, conceptual thinking of each and every course and then each and every topic we are covering in the teleconferencing session that is also one of the okay. two yeah so uh, very rightly you have linked this whole uh, concept of this but you know as you all know uh, the the experts just informed us that the teaching learning uh, through ignu takes place and the paramount and the important aspect is that how we are providing the best study material to the learners we are going to provide you the uh, study material which is in the print form we are going to offer you the face to face counseling at the study center or through this very media maybe we are we, we are going to organize this teleconferencing session we are going to have some supplementary gyanvani sessions we we are going to talk to you we are going to have the online sessions we may organize some program through the online uh, social media network so we are integrating all this available media all the available multimedia approach to make our learners aware about this program but this this we talked about how we are providing the support services but how to take admissions how where they are going to seek their admissions how to apply for this particular program and all this i would like to ask from uh, dr suspita yes sir so the uh, admission process uh, the student can always uh, approach uh, indira gandhi national open university also the regional centers and this is also available online on the ignu samarth uh, platform you can uh, view it on uh, 
uh, ignoadmission.samarth.edu.in. So here you will find the fresh admission and in the list of programs, the postgraduate diploma in environmental management and law, the details will be given, the prospectus and the uh, program uh, details are uh, given over here. And this program uh, has uh, like the target that any graduate is eligible to apply for this. So um, yeah. we urge all of you to come and join uh, yeah. for this program so and make it a yeah. success. Thank you, ma'am. And I would like to request our control room to hold this uh, uh, email address and this uh, about the admission link. I would like to just impress upon the uh, viewers that this is admission in IGNU takes place entirely. It's an online process. We are just showing you a link which is there, which you can find it on www.ignu.ac.in. There also you can get it or otherwise the admission link for this particular program is very much available on this. And for going on this, you have to register first, first yourself. And for registering yourself, you have to have three things with you. First is your name your date of birth, your mobile number, and last is your email address. The moment all these four things are with you, we will be giving you a kind of a, a link where you can log into this very uh, page and you can apply for filled in application form, which should be reached to us online. And last date for putting up your application is as on date is 31st of January, 2023. So even I am excited. And I'm very, very uh, excited to share with you is that even I'm going to be a student of this particular program, looking at the concern of the society, the concern of the management, environmental management, and the law thereby to protect this. So this is very important program. Apart from this, uh, Professor Baskar, would you like to add something more about this pr program? That uh, uh, the one concern for all of us is that those who are on the other side, the prospective students, that though you have already told that these are the area where they can get the employment, what do you feel the future of this program? Okay, very nice question, sir. In fact, if you see uh, the uh, uh, development, the debate is how to have sustainable development. And, you know, uh, we are going to become a big economy and industries will be set up. Uh, development will take place when all this takes place there will be environmental impacts and there will be issues and who are the people who will solve this they are the environmental lawyers and that is where the new job opportunities will come and whether you are working in a company or in an industry or in a government sector or you are a freelance activist knowledge of law environmental law will always help to protect the environment and preserve our mother earth I feel there is a great career opportunity given the scope of development which we are going to see in the coming decades. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. And, and last, uh, but uh, for this particular program, the time is running out. I must tell you is that exemptions are being organized very close to your uh, place where you are staying and the exemptions are being organized twice. So far, we have organized all the uh, examination in the offline mode and in the times to come. We are also exploring the possibilities of organizing the program in the online mode. So uh, don't worry about the kind of support services. We all are there through this media and through the uh, self-study material. We are reaching you and our regional center uh, spread across the countries are there to help you out. So uh, I take this opportunity to extend my very uh, warm thanks to all of you for sparing your valuable time to talk to us, to our learners, to our viewers. Uh, to make this program a very, very lively program. And I am sure the uh, learners, prospective learners are going to take part in our program. Once again, thanks, Professor Rupini. Thank thanks, you, Professor Baskar. Thanks, Thank Professor you, Susmitaji. And, and thanks, one and all, those who, ha who are watching this program. I'm signing it off from uh, the moment and with the hope that we are going to have more participants in the, this particular program as far as the, their admissions are concerned. And till such time, तब तक हम हमें अनुमति दीजिए हमारे पूरे टीम को अनुमति दीजिए आप आनंद में रहें स्वस्थ रहें और आप रखें अपना ख्याल अपनों का रखें ख्याल जय हिंद जय भारत
are you a fresh graduate do you want to fulfill your educational aspiration by pursuing higher education in various interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary areas like environmental science environment and occupational health philosophy sustainability science folklore and culture studies if yes the school of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies offers various program like masters program graduate program post graduate diploma certificate and appreciation program the school offers five masters program master of science environmental science the eligibility criteria for msc environmental science is graduate in science btech be agriculture graduate forestry graduate and veterinary graduate school also offers masters in environment and occupational health masters in sustainability science masters in philosophy and masters in folklore and culture studies the eligibility criteria for these four masters program is graduate in any discipline school also offers various socially relevant and need based pg diploma program like pg diploma in sustainability science pg diploma in environment and occupational health pg diploma in folklore and culture studies and pg diploma in migration and diaspora studies the school also offers pg certificate in climate change and avshist prabandhan mein praman patra the school also offers two doctoral program phd in environmental science and phd in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies the school offers where डी के सभी दर्शकों को ज्ञान दर्शन चैनल की तरफ से स्वागत है मैं डॉक्टर सुमन सिंह आज आपके सामने बिजनेस यानी व्यावसायिक आयोजन क्या होते हैं खेल से संबंधित आयोजन क्या होते हैं इसके संदर्भ में बात करूंगी आज इसके अंतर्गत जिन विषयों के बारे में आप जानेंगे वे विषय हैं व्यावसायिक आयोजन क्या होते हैं व्यावसायिक आयोजन कितने प्रकार के होते हैं खेल से संबंधित आयोजन क्या होते हैं खेल उद्योग का पैमाना क्या होता है खेल कितने प्रकार के होते हैं एवं भारत में खेल की क्या स्थिति है भारत में खेल की क्या दशा है इसके बारे में जानेंगे खेल आयोजनों में प्रौद्योगिकी के क्या लाभ हैं खेल आयोजनों का विपणन में क्या संभावनाएं हैं व्यापार एवं खेल से संबंधित आयोजनों का सामाजिक एवं आर्थिक क्या प्रभाव पड़ता है एवं खेल आयोजन का प्रबंधन सबसे पहले हम बात करते हैं व्यावसायिक आयोजन क्या होते हैं व्यावसायिक आयोजन का क्षेत्र काफ़ी विस्तृत होता है आज भारत की अर्थव्यवस्था दुनिया की सबसे बड़ी अर्थव्यवस्थाओं में शामिल है भारत की अर्थव्यवस्था भारत के व्यवसाय छोटे और बड़े व्यवसाय जो भी हैं उनसे व्यवसाय उनसे व्यवसाय के क्षेत्र में काफ़ी संभावनाएँ विकसित हुई हैं व्यावसायिक आयोजन वे आयोजन होते हैं जो किसी उद्यम को जो अर्थ से संबंधित रणनीतियों को तय करने के लिए दो व्यक्ति दो टीम आपस में आमने सामने सम्मिलित होते हैं वे उसमें लक्षित दर्शक होते हैं उपभोक्ता होते हैं और नेता होते हैं वे सभी व्यक्ति एक जगह बैठ कर के कोई व्यावसायिक आयोजन व्यवसाय यानी अर्थ को बढ़ाने से संबंधित आयोजन 
करते हैं उसे व्यवसायिक आयोजन कहा जाता है 19वीं शताब्दी में उत्तरी अमेरिका में राजनीतिक और धार्मिक कांग्रेस में पेशेवर संघों के सम्मेलनों में विशेष आयोजन उभर करके सामने आए ऐतिहासिक दृष्टिकोण से अगर बात की जाए तो पहले व्यवसाय को इतना विस्तृत तरीके से नहीं जाना जाता था उसे तकनीकी से काफ़ी दूर रखा गया था व्यवसाय से जो घर परिवार में लोग होते थे एक व्यक्ति ही आय का अर्जन करते थे वे आय का आय अर्जित करके परिवार चलाते थे परंतु धीरे धीरे बदलते समय में वे व्यवसाय को तकनीकी से जोड़ करके और आयोजन से जोड़ करके देखा जाने लगा और यह एक विस्तृत अवधारणा के रूप में सामने आई व्यवसाय दिन प्रतिदिन सकारात्मक प्रगति की तरफ बढ़ रहा है आयोजक आयोजन कंपनियां व्यवसाय को बहुत अधिक तक अधिक सीमा तक बढ़ाने में कारगर साबित हो रही हैं व्यवसायिक आयोजन बी टू बी या सी बी टू सी सिद्धांतों पर आधारित होती हैं बी टू बी अर्थात उपभोक्ता और व्यवसाय व्यवसाय से व्यवसाय एवं उपभोक्ता से व्यवसाय इस सिद्धांत पर व्यवसाय आधारित होते हैं इसके अंतर्गत जानते हैं कि व्यवसायिक आयोजन कितने प्रकार के होते हैं व्यवसायिक आयोजन मुख्य रूप से नौ प्रकार के होते हैं कुछ व्यवसायिक आयोजन मुख्य हैं जैसे कि एम और कारपोरेट आयोजन बैठक और सम्मेलन प्रोत्साहन नेटवर्किंग आयोजन कारपोरेट आतिथ्य प्रदर्शनियाँ और व्यापार शो उत्पाद लान सेवा लान सक्रियता खुदरा कार्यक्रम आयोजन अन्य व्यावसायिक आयोजन जैसे कि मर्चेंडाइजिंग आयोजन विशेष विक्री प्रलोभन आयोजन प्रदर्शन और फिल्म टेलीविजन आधारित आयोजन ग्रामीण सक्रियता इसमें हम सबसे पहले बात करते हैं एम आई सी ई कारपोरेट आयोजन एम आई सी ई कारपोरेट आयोजन यह एक इंडस्ट्री होती है जो कि व्यवसाय से संबंधित आयोजन को आयोजित करती है इसमें काफ़ी अपार संभावनाओं का विकास करते हैं लोग उपभोक्ता और व्यवसायिक जगत के सभी आयोजनकर्ता इसमें सम्मिलित होते हैं और इसके दो खंड होते हैं आंतरिक खंड एवं बाह्य खंड आंतरिक खंड वे होते हैं जो कि आंतरिक व्यवस्थाओं को देखते हैं और बाह्य का खंड होते हैं जैसे कि भ्रमण कंपनियां एयरलाइंस इन सभी विभिन्न प्रकार के प्रभाव को देखते हैं और इसमें समान हित समान अवसर सम्मिलित होता है आगे बढ़ते हुए बात करते हैं बैठक और सम्मेलन बैठक सम्मेलन को परिणाम और परिचर्चा के आधार पर तीन प्रकार के बांटे गए हैं सबसे पहला है सूचना लेने वाली बैठक सूचना लेने वाली बैठक जैसा कि नाम से ही आप समझ पा रहे होंगे सूचना लेने वाली बैठक वह बैठक होती है जिसमें नेता किसी विषय से संबंधित तथ्यों को प्रस्तुत करता है जो व्यवसायी होते हैं उनके समक्ष बताता है कि किस विषय पर सूचना हमें एकत्र करनी है और वे अपनी राय को देते हैं इस प्रकार से सूचना ले लेने वाली बैठक में सूचना क्या लेनी है किस तरीके से लेनी है और किन किन माध्यमों से लेनी है इन इसके बारे में इसमें विचार विमर्श किया जाता है दूसरा है सूचना देने वाली बैठक सूचना देने वाली बैठक से तात्पर्य है इसे एक सलाहकार बैठक के रूप में भी जाना जा, जाता है सलाहकार बैठक के रूप में जैसे कि इसमें नेता सूचना देने वाली सूचना किस विषय पे देना है और आमने सामने बैठ कर के विचार विमर्श किया जाता है और सूचना एक तरीके से क्रमबद्ध तरीके से प्रस्तुत की जाती है राय मशवरा करने के बाद जो है कि वो मुक्त प्रश्नावली होती है मुक्त प्रश्नावली प्रस्तुत करते हैं और उन्हें अवसर देते हैं कि लोग उसमें क्या क्या प्रश्न पूछना चाहते हैं और क्या जानना चाहते हैं ये सारे लोग उसको देखते हैं आगे बढ़ते हुए बात करते हैं समस्या समाधान बैठक समस्या समाधान बैठक क्या होती है समस्या समाधान बैठक जैसे कि इसमें नेता को काफ़ी विनम्र रूप से लोगों के सामने प्रस्तुत होना पड़ता है और किस समस् जो व्यवसायी वर्ग होता है उनके साथ बैठ करके वो समस्या समाधान की तरफ बात करते हैं कि 
क्या समस्याएं हैं और उसकी उसका समाधान क्या होगा किस तरीके से समाधान निकलेगा समस्या के बारे में काफ़ी विस्तृत रूप से वे बात करते हैं और बात ही नहीं करते बल्कि उसका समाधान ढूंढ लेते हैं कि इसका क्या समाधान होगा व्यापार व्यावसायिक जगत से संबंधित क्या समाधान होंगे या जो रणनीतियाँ तैयार की जाएंगी उससे संबंधित क्या तो वे सभी व्यवसायी वर्ग एक साथ मिल करके समस्या के समाधान को ढूंढते हैं आगे बात करते हैं प्रोत्साहन प्रोत्साहन जैसा कि कहा गया है ये काफ़ी यात्राओं से संबंधित होता है आज प्रत्येक वर्ग व्यवसाय के क्षेत्र में यात्राएं काफ़ी योगदान दे रही हैं यात्राओं से हमारे देश का जो राजस्व है आर्थिक व्यवस्था काफ़ी सुदृढ़ हो रही है कहते हैं कि हर व्यक्ति आज रुचि ले रहा है यात्राओं में रुचि ले रहा है कि सैर कर दुनिया की गाफिल जिंद गानी फिर कहाँ जिंद गानी गर रही तो नौजवानी फिर कहाँ प्रोत्साहन के अंतर्गत आयोजनकर्ता या व्यवसायी यात्राओं से संबंधित भ्रमण से संबंधित आयोजन करते हैं और उन्हें व्यवसायिक जगत को किस तरीके से हम बढ़ाते हैं अर्थ आर्थिक व्यवस्था को किस तरह से बढ़ाते हैं इन सब के बारे में हम बात करते हैं कि एक लक्षित दर्शक किस तरीके से आयोजन करेगा और तकनीकी का कैसे इस्तेमाल करेगा इन सभी विषयों पे वे बात करते हैं भारत में बहुत सारे गंतव्य हैं जो यात्राओं को बढ़ाते हैं जैसे कि दुबई दुबई एक बहुत ही बहुत यात्रा या भ्रमण के हिसाब से बहुत ही उचित स्थान है जो व्यावसायिक जगत में काफ़ी सुदृढ़ है और अन्य स्थानों पर आयोजन करता आयोजित करते हैं व्यवसाय को व्यावसायिक आयोजन जगह जगह होता है जो जैसे किसी होटल में कोई जितने भी व्यावसायिक वर्ग के लोग होते हैं वे एकत्र होते हैं उन्हें एकत्र करके व्यावसायिक आयोजन किए जाते हैं आगे बढ़ते हुए हम बात करते हैं नेटवर्किंग आयोजन नेटवर्किंग का आयोजन मुख्य रूप से तीन बिंदुओं पर आधारित होता है नेटवर्किंग आयोजन के अंतर्गत यह आज जो जिस हिसाब से समय बदल चुका है तो प्रत्येक व्यवसायिक दुनिया में दूर दूर बैठे होते हैं तो उन्हें किस तरीके से एक साथ जोड़ेंगे यह नेटवर्किंग के माध्यम से प्रत्येक व्यवसायिक वर्ग से हम जुड़ते हैं हम ये देखते हैं कि वो किस प्रकार से क्या हमारी समस्या है कभी कभी उत्पाद के क्षेत्र में कुछ ऐसे प्रोडक्ट होते हैं कुछ ऐसे उत्पाद होते हैं जिन्हें प्रचार प्रसार की आवश्यकता पड़ती है प्रचार प्रसार की आवश्यकता के लिए तो उन उत्पाद को लॉन्च करने के लिए उनके प्रसार एवं बिक्री को बढ़ाने के लिए हम नेटवर्किंग का आयोजन करते हैं नेटवर्किंग का आयोजन करने के बाद तीन बिंदुओं पे स्थित होता है जैसे कि जो प्रतिभागी होते हैं उनका उद्देश्य क्या होता है किस विचार किसके बारे में बात करना है यह नेटवर्किंग के माध्यम से एक दूसरे से हम संबंधित होते हैं फिर बात करते हैं कि कारपोरेट आतिथ्य क्या होता है जब व्यावसायिक वर्ग को व्यावसायिक रिश्तों को और व्यावसायिक जगत के सभी लोगों के को एक साथ सुदृढ़ करने के लिए और व्यावसायिक रिश्ते मजबूत करने के लिए एक दूसरे को ए, एक जगह पे कोई आयोजन किया जाता है जिसमें उनके आने की व्यवस्था जाने की व्यवस्था बैठने की व्यवस्था और किस प्रकार से क्या समस्याएं होती हैं कैसे बाज़ार में मूल्यों को और उत्पादित समस्याओं को किस तरीके से समाधान किया जाए कैसे उनके बाज़ार मूल्य को बढ़ाया जाए इन सभी चीज़ों पे विचार विमर्श करते हैं आज प्रत्येक व्यावसायिक वर्ग सिर्फ सौंदर्य ही नहीं खोजता अभी तो वह संतुष्टि भी खोजता है कि वो किस प्रकार से कैसे प्रोडक्ट खरीदे किस तरह से जिस जिस हिसाब से आज प्रतियोगिता बढ़ गई है और दुकान तरीके कई तरीके के खुलते हैं सभी व्यवसायी वर्ग अपने व्यवसाय को लेकर काफ़ी चिंतित रहते हैं सजग रहते हैं और दिन प्रतिदिन उन्हें बढ़ाने में लगे रहते हैं कि किस प्रकार से हम उन्हें बढ़ाएँ तो आयोजनकर्ता आतिथ्य का आतिथ्य से संबंधित आयोजन को आयोजित करते समय यह ध्यान रखते हैं कि कैसे उन्हें आना है कैसे जाना है कहाँ पे आयोजन करना है आयोजन से संबंधित किन चीज़ों का प्रयोग करेंगे और कैसे दिखाएंगे इन सभी चीज़ों के बारे में वह व्यवस्था करते हैं और उनसे संबंधित खाने की सम, खाने की सामग्री 
और जाते समय उपहार की भी व्यवस्था कहीं कहीं देखी जाती है कि वह क्योंकि यह देखा जाता है कि जब एक बार उपभोक्ता संतुष्ट होता है तभी वह दूसरी बार आने की कोशिश करता है तो प्रथम बार में प्रथम बार में जो है कि उसको काफ़ी काफ़ी उस ऐसा देख आ, करना पड़ता है कि वो संतुष्ट होकर के जाए और दोबारा वो आना चाहे तो इसका काफ़ी ध्यान रखना पड़ता है और जब हमारे देश में ये एक कहावत भी कही गई कि अतिथि एक भगवान के स्वरूप होता है जिससे उसे किस प्रकार से हम जो वह जिस उद्देश्य से आया है उसका वह उद्देश्य पूरा हुआ है कि नहीं हुआ है इन सारी चीज़ों के बारे में वो ध्यान रखते हैं कि कैसे हमें अतिथि का स्वागत करना है और जिस उद्देश्य से आया है वह संतुष्ट होकर के जा रहा है या नहीं जा रहा है यह आयोजन कारपोरेट आतिथ्य के अंतर्गत आते हैं उन्हें बैठने की व्यवस्था उचित ठहरने की व्यवस्था इन सभी चीज़ों के बारे में बातचीत करते हैं आगे बढ़ते हुए बात करते हैं प्रदर्शनियाँ और व्यापार सो प्रदर्शनी में प्रदर्शनी कई तरीके की होती है जब व्यावसायिक सम व्यावसायिक जगह से संबंधित किसी विभिन्न प्रकार के वस्तुओं का एक जगह एकत्रीकरण होता है उससे संबंधित ज्ञान दिया जाता है तो वे व्यावसायिक आयोजन होते हैं और व्यावसायिक आयोजन प्रदर्शनियों में लगाए जाते हैं और उपभोक्ता भी होते हैं और जो विक्रेता होते हैं वो भी होते हैं इससे उपभोक्ता क्रेता विक्रेता का आपस में सामंजस्य काफ़ी अच्छा होता है और वो वहीं प्रत्यक्ष रूप से संपर्क कर लेते हैं प्रदर्शनियों में मनोरंजन गीत संगीत नृत्य का भी आयोजन किया जाता है तरह तरह के स्टॉल लगाए जाते हैं विभिन्न जगह की कंपनियां अपने अपने प्रोडक्ट को प्रदर्शनी में लेकर के आती हैं प्रदर्शनियां आम जनता को काफ़ी आकर्षित करती हैं यह कुछ समय के लिए होती है और इनका आयोजन काफ़ी विस्तृत स्तर पर किया जाता है कभी कभी ये प्रदर्शनियाँ जैसे कि ग्रामीण स्तर पर और स्थानीय स्तर पे भी की जाती है कभी कभी बहुत बड़ी प्रदर्शनी लगाई जाती है जो राष्ट्रीय स्तर पे। दिल्ली के प्रगति मैदान में एक भारत व्यापार संवर्धन द्वारा प्रगति मैदान में एक बहुत ही बड़ा व्यापार मेले का आयोजन किया जाता है जो 14 से 27 सितंबर तक 14 से 27 नवंबर तक यह आयोजन किया जाता है इसमें बहुत बड़ा व्यापारी वर्ग जुड़ता है और सभी देशों के व्यापारी वर्ग इसमें सम्मिलित होते हैं अपने व्यापार को प्रसारित करते हैं प्रचारित करते हैं और लोगों तक आने की कोशिश करते हैं जिससे ये अधिक से अधिक जनता तक जा सके अब हम बात करते हैं उत्पाद लॉन्च सेवा लॉन्च और सक्रियता उत्पाद लॉन्च अर्थात विभिन्न कंपनियां अपने उत्पादन को बनाती हैं और उनको बहुत पहली बार जनता के समक्ष रखने के लिए बहुत बड़ा आयोजन किया जाता है ताकि वो ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा लोगों तक पहुंच सके लोग बहुत ज़्यादा संख्या में उसको जान सके इसके लिए आयोजन करता लोगों को एक निमंत्रण पत्र भेज करके किसको बुलाना है कौन उससे संबंधित है ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा लोगों को उससे जोड़ने की कोशिश करते हैं वे चाहते हैं कि बहुत ज़्यादा लोग जुड़े ताकि नया जो प्रोडक्ट बना है उसको लॉन्च एक बहुत शानदार तरीके से लॉन्च करने की कोशिश करते हैं जितने लोग जुड़ेंगे फ़ायदा भी उतना अधिक होता है और इसके लिए गीत संगीत नृत्य और काफ़ी व्यवस्थित मंच का भी आयोजन किया जाता है सबके बैठने की व्यवस्था खाने की व्यवस्था सारी चीज़ों का और चिकित्सा संबंधित व्यवस्थाएं, व्यक्ति के दैनिक जीवन से संबंधित जो भी आवश्यकताएं होती हैं उनकी सभी की उसमें व्यवस्था की जाती है कि वे आएं और पहली बार कोई प्रोडक्ट लॉन्च हो रहा है उसके लॉन्च में सम्मिलित हो उसके बारे में जाने और जो कंपनी का प्रोडक्ट होता है वह उसके बारे में विस्तृत जानकारी देती है कि ये किस किस तरीके से बाजार में बेचा जाएगा कहाँ कहाँ बेचा जाएगा और कैसे लोगों तक ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा लोगों तक पहुँचाया जाएगा इस बारे में लोग बताते हैं सेवा विभिन्न प्रकार की कंपनियाँ होती हैं जो अपने कंपनी में बनाए हुए सेवाओं को लॉन्च करती हैं और इसमें काफ़ी सक्रिय रूप से भाग लेती हैं उत्पाद विभिन्न प्रकार के होते हैं जैसे कि मेडिकल से संबंधित या फिर आ, लोगों के दैनिक जीवन में जो जैसे वैवाहिक आयोजन होते हैं या सांस्कृतिक आयोजन होते हैं इन सभी तरीकों से होते हैं जो जीव व्यक्ति के प्रत्येक क्षेत्र से जुड़े हो सकते हैं 
आगे बढ़ते हुए हम बात करते हैं खुदरा कार्यक्रम खुदरा कार्यक्रम क्या होता है खुदरा कार्यक्रम में जैसे कि फुटकर विक्रेता शामिल होते हैं ये पूरे जगह जगह से लोग फुटकर विक्रेताओं को बुलाते हैं उन्हें अपने सेवाओं के साथ उत्पादों के साथ उसमें शामिल करते हैं उत्पाद के साथ शामिल करके वे अपने उत्पाद के बारे में स्वयं उपभोक्ताओं को बताते हैं कि कैसे इसका उपयोग करना है कैसे किस तरीके से आपको इससे फ़ायदा होगा और उपभोक्ता इसको स्वयं देख करके जान करके समझ करके उनका चयन करते हैं और छोटे छोटे दुकानदार भी होते हैं जो इस कार्यक्रम में सम्मिलित होते हैं इस प्रकार के आयोजन बड़े स्तर पे छोटे स्तर पे दोनों स्तर पे होते हैं खुदरा कार्यक्रम में छोटे छोटे व्यक्ति या बड़े व्यक्ति सभी लोग सम्मिलित हो सकते हैं ये हमारे ग्रामीण अर्थव्यवस्था राष्ट्रीय अर्थव्यवस्था और अंतर्राष्ट्रीय अर्थव्यवस्थाओं को काफ़ी सुदृढ़ करते हैं अब नवा है अन्य व्यावसायिक आयोजन अन्य व्यावसायिक आयोजन जैसे कि सबसे पहले बात करते हैं मर्चेंडाइजिंग आयोजन मर्चेंडाइजिंग आयोजन क्या होते हैं जैसे कभी कभी कोई विशेष दुकान पर कोई मशहूर व्यक्ति किसी प्रोडक्ट का को का उद्घाटन करते हैं या उनको काफ़ी हाईलाइट करते हैं और उनका उन प्रोडक्ट का जब दौरा होता है या ऐसे दुकानों का दौरा होता है तो ऐसे कार्यक्रम को ऐसे आयोजन को मर्चेंडाइजिंग आयोजन कहा जाता है यह किसी विशेष वस्तु से संबंधित होते हैं जैसे कि साबुन गहने कंगन या कुछ भी हो सकता है जो एक विशेष व्यक्ति पर कोई खास व्यक्ति द्वारा काफ़ी हाईलाइट किया जाता है उसका उद्घाटन किया जाता है और इससे वह कह कब बहुत सारे लोगों तक पहुंचता है जिससे अधिक से अधिक लोग जानकारी ले पाते हैं और बहुत लोगों में वो प्रचारित हो जाता है तो अधिक से अधिक लोग उससे जुड़ पाते हैं आगे बात करते हैं विशेष बिक्री प्रलोभन विशेष बिक्री प्रलोभन क्या होता है जैसा कि कभी कभी कुछ दुकान या कुछ मॉल कुछ कंपनियां अपने प्रोडक्ट को लॉन्च करती हैं उन्हें मार्केट में ले जाती हैं और विशेष उपहार देती हैं विशेष प्रलोभन देती हैं जैसे कि बाय वन गेट वन या एक खरीदे दो पाए दो खरीदे तीन पाए इस तरीके के प्रलोभन देती हैं जिससे आम जनता काफ़ी आकर्षित होती है और जो काफ़ी दिनों से कंपनियों के पास जो प्रोडक्ट पड़े होते हैं उनकी समर्थता के लिए उनको अधिक लोगों तक पहुंचाने के लिए भी ऐसे कार्यक्रमों का आयोजन किया जाता है और इस तरीके के कार्यक्रम के आयोजन करने के लिए आयोजनकर्ता लोगों से एक समन्वय स्थापित करते हैं और इसके माध्यम से बहुत सारी बहुत प्रोडक्ट की बिक्री बढ़ जाती है और अधिक से अधिक लोगों तक सामान पहुंच जाता है प्रदर्शन प्रदर्शन जैसा कि हम बात करते हैं प्रदर्शन में सभी तरीके की चीज़ों का प्रदर्शन किया जाता है राष्ट्रीय स्तर अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर सभी और सभी वर्ग के व्यवसायी वर्ग इसमें जुड़ते हैं फिल्म एवं टेलीविजन से आधारित आयोजन फिल्म एवं टेलीविजन से आप सभी लोग परिचित होंगे और छोटे छोटे जो धारावाहिक सिनेमा फिल्म आते हैं सभी देखते हैं तो आयोजन करता जब किसी फिल्म की शूटिंग से लेकर रिलीज से लेकर उसके लॉन्च होने तक और उसकी जो सफलता होती है उसको सेलिब्रेट करने तक की सारी प्रक्रियाओं को आयोजित करते हैं क्रमबद्ध रूप से आयोजित करके कितना सफल रहा कितना नहीं सफल रहा इन सब के आयोजन के बारे में देखते हैं तो ऐसे कार्यक्रम फिल्म अथवा टेलीविजन आधारित कार्यक्रम के अंतर्गत आते हैं ग्रामीण सक्रियता ग्रामीण सक्रियता के अंतर्गत जैसा कि हम सभी जानते हैं कि कोई बहुत बड़ा हमारा देश गांव का देश है और बहुत ही बड़ा वर्ग गांव से जुड़ा हुआ है पुरई पालो खपरेलो में रहीमा रमुआ के नाव में है अपना हिंदुस्तान कहाँ वह बसा हमारे गाँव में गाँव में हमारी अधिक से अधिक आबादी रहती है उन्हें व्यावसायिक वर्ग अपने से जोड़ता है आयोजनकर्ता खुद से जोड़ता है और ताकि ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा सामान की बिक्री हम वहाँ तक कर सके कभी कभी बहुत सारा उत्पाद तैयार हो जाता है लॉन्च हो जाता है परंतु एक ही स्थान पर पड़ा रह जाता है उसकी उसके उसका प्रचार प्रसार वहाँ तक नहीं हुआ रहता है तो इसलिए ग्रामीण सक्रियता को इसमें जोड़ते हैं ग्रामीण वर्ग को जोड़ते हैं 
और कब एक समय था जबकि सूर्योदय अभियान का आयोजन किया गया था सूर्योदय अभियान के अंतर्गत जैसे कि स्वच्छ प्रकाश की व्यवस्था या स्वच्छ प्रकाश उचित प्रकाश सौर ऊर्जा के माध्यम से लालटीन के माध्यम से बहुत प्रकाश की व्यवस्था घरों घरों तक हो पाए इसके लिए सूर्योदय योजना का प्रारंभ किया गया था या सूर्योदय अभियान चलाए गए थे ये आयोजनकर्ता ग्रामीण लोगों को इससे जोड़ करके रखे थे और वहाँ तक इन्होंने पहुँचाया था और जैसे कभी कभी होता है कि लोग गांव के लोग दूर देश जाकर के नौकरी करते हैं और आय अर्जन करते हैं उन्हें घर पैसा भेजने में दिक्कत होती है तो उनके लिए एम पैसा सर्विस की शुरुआत की गई थी इसके माध्यम से वे दूर बैठे हुए अपने परिवार तक पैसे भेज पाते थे तो आयोजनकर्ता इस तरह के आयोजन को भी आयोजित करते हैं जिसमें अधिक से अधिक ग्रामीण स्तर के लोग सम्मिलित होते हैं अब आगे बढ़ते हुए बात करते हैं खेल संबंधित आयोजन खेल संबंधित आयोजन खेल हमारे दैनिक जीवन के लिए बहुत ही आवश्यक है खेल हर देश की शान होता है इसको बनाने वाला बहुत ही महान है हमारा इससे शारीरिक मानसिक व्यक्तिगत सभी प्रकार के विकास होते हैं खेल हमारे जीवन के लिए बहुत उपयोगी होते हैं यह हर देश के लिए ऊपर बहुत आवश्यक है खेल के प्रमुख पैमाने इस प्रकार हैं जैसे कि स्थानीय क्षेत्रीय पैमाना राष्ट्रीय पैमाना अंतर्राष्ट्रीय वैश्विक घटना कुछ खेल स्थानीय स्तर पर जैसे विद्यालय महाविद्यालय स्तर पर आयोजित होते हैं वे खेल स्थानीय के अंतर्गत आते हैं इन पैमानों पर ये खेल आधारित होते हैं क्षेत्रीय आयोजन क्षेत्रीय स्तर पर जो खेल आयोजित हो होते हैं वे क्षेत्रीय आयोजन के अंतर्गत आते हैं राष्ट्रीय जो देश स्तर पर खेल से संबंधित आयोजन करता आयोजित करते हैं वे खेल से संबंधित आयोजन या राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर आयोजित होते हैं अंतर्राष्ट्रीय आयोजन अंतर्राष्ट्रीय आयोजन जैसे कि बहुत देश से बाहर जा कर के जब किसी खेल से संबंधित आयोजन किए जाते हैं तो वे अंतर्राष्ट्रीय आयोजन होते हैं वैश्विक आयोजन वैश्विक जो विश्व स्तर पर खेल आयोजित किए जाते हैं वे आयोजन वैश्विक आयोजन होते हैं जिसको मेगा आयोजन कहते हैं ये बहुत ही बड़े स्तर पे होता है इसमें आयोजन करता कहाँ कहाँ से लोग सम्मिलित होंगे कैसे सम्मिलित होंगे इन सारी चीज़ों के बारे में वे बताते हैं खेल के प्रकार जैसे कि ओलंपिक खेल क्रिकेट विश्व कप फीफा विश्व कप राष्ट्रमंडल खेल इंडियन प्रीमियर लीग हॉकी विश्व कप ये सभी मेगा खेल के होते हैं ये बड़े खेल होते हैं यह खेल ही नहीं बल्कि एक अनुष्ठान होता है जिसमें लोग बहुत बड़ी संख्या में सम्मिलित होते हैं और इनमें चिकित्सा से संबंधित बैठने की व्यवस्था ठहरने की व्यवस्था सभी व्यवस्थाओं के बारे में आयोजनकर्ता काफ़ी बारीकी से अध्ययन करते हैं और बहुत लंबा समय लगा करके इसकी योजना तैयार करते हैं भारत में खेल भारत में खेल बहुत ही प्रारंभ समय से चले आ रहे हैं और यह दिन प्रतिदिन बढ़ रहे हैं खेल आयोजन में प्रौद्योगिकी जैसा कि तकनीकी हमारे जीवन का बहुत अभिन्न अंग बन चुका है और खेल जगत को प्रत्येक व्यक्ति तक पहुंचाने के लिए दूर दूर तक उसका बहुत बड़े स्तर पर प्रचारित करने के लिए तकनीकी बहुत ही लाभदायी साबित होती है खेल आयोजनों में व्यापार की बहुत बड़ी संभावनाएं होती हैं खेल आयोजन का सामाजिक और आर्थिक प्रभाव काफ़ी गहरा पड़ता है जो हमारे समाज को सकारात्मक और नकारात्मक दोनों रूप से प्रभावित करता है तो आज आपने जाना कि व्यावसायिक आयोजन क्या होते हैं व्यावसायिक आयोजन जो व्यवसाय को बढ़ाने वाले उद्यम होते हैं उनके बारे में रणनीतियाँ तय करते हैं ये कई प्रकार के होते हैं जीवन का प्रत्येक क्षेत्र से संबंधित है व्यवसायिक आयोजन और खेल से संबंधित आयोजन खेल के पैमानों के बारे में खेल का क्या प्रभाव पड़ता है इसके साथ हम विदा लेते हैं धन्यवाद नमस्कार